the last video went a little bit long, and that's uh, my fault. So they got split up. So I want to talk about the three real gurus of quality, and the first is W. Edwards Deming. This guy is, is amazing. He really kicked off this entire thing. He led the Japanese quality revolution that happened uh, in the 70s and the 80s where the Japanese basically took over the entire United States car market. Now, as you look at this, this is true. Ms. Uh, Dr. Deming is not Japanese. He actually came up with all of this stuff for, I believe it was Ford, and he brought it to the car company in the 70s and like, this is, this is important. This is something that we can do. And they all said, we don't need you, you know, go, go away. And so he took it to the Japanese who embraced it and it really kickstarted their entire, you know, reputation for quality. Because especially in the, the 50s and 60s, Japanese pro they Japanese products were viewed the way that we view Chinese products now. They were viewed as very low quality, very cheap. If you ever watched the original Back to the Future, there's actually a line in there because as the movie is set in the 80s and he shows uh, Dr. Brown, uh, Michael J. Fox's character shows Dr. Brown, the, the thing, and he's like, oh, look, this is why it was awful. It was made in Japan. And Michael J. Fox's character's like, but Japan makes the best stuff. So it was a just a demonstration of how, you know, ideas change quickly. And so, but anyway, so what his thing was is he developed a 14-point program for implementing quality improvement, and he was a big believer in the workers who were responsible for solving the problem. And this entire method was really it was really set up for continuous improvements and really trying to hit that mythical zero defects line. And so actually, if we step back a little bit and then we look at, we have Joe Giron. I, I actually, Giron, I think I'm saying that right. I may be wrong. But he really added a human dimension to the whole quality talking really about education and training of the workers. And so he was really one of the pioneers of the development of quality control departments. All, all major companies now have a quality control department where stuff comes into. And he really focused on minimizing that cost of quality, that, uh, that amount of cost that you're going to have because of products being returned, products being having to be repaired. If you eliminate all of that before it goes out the door, out the door, that really minimizes that cost and quality. So, and so the last of our gurus would be Philip Crosby. He wrote that uh, the book Quality is Free in 1979, and he believed that the cost of things being poor quality was really understated. And so he is actually where the term zero defects was coined. And once again, this is something that you'll hear a lot in that entire Six Sigma process of doing things. And he's quoted as saying, there's no reason for having errors or defects in any product or service. So if we look at this, there's a common theme. And so these are our three gurus. These are the ones that sit high on the mountains and tells us how our company can have quality and how they should do it. And their three common themes are prevention over detection, which means that you design things, you put your processes together, you have everything set up so you can prevent a defect instead of detecting it later. Because once again, if we think back to that chart that I showed you from HP, where they tracked out what a defect cost you, if you catch the problem as it's coming in the door, three tenths of a cent. If you catch the problem after the product's been delivered, $300. So these guys are all focusing on, qual on prevention, so stopping that initial problem before finding out later it's a problem. And they were all very big on quality is a powerful competitive weapon to earn business. And once again, this is how especially your high-end companies want to 
That's how they justify being able to charge all that money for your iPhone or for your Samsung Galaxy is we've got a real quality product. As my dog is barking at the people going down the street, I'm sorry about that. But as I was saying, they are, they're the ones that have really said, hey, if we've got a quality product, you know, Apple and Samsung can go and sell their smartphones and go, these are real quality and demand that premium for it. So if we will look at the approach to minimizing quality. Now, so this is going to be a very interesting, interesting graph. So what I have here is the cost per good unit of product. So what this is going to cost us for every little unit of whatever we're doing. It could be we're selling a widget. It can be we're delivering coffee to somebody. It could be that we're cutting hair. It doesn't really matter. And so then we have the defect rate at the beginning. 100% defective means the product's complete garbage. 100% good means no defects. This is kind of a theoretical, that you're never going to have zero defects, but you want to drive as close as you can get to that. So the cost of failure. So if you have a product that's failing, and this is, you know, cost of returns, cost of repairs, cost of warranties, the more defective the product is, it's going to cost you more money. So let's look at the other side then. It's the cost of appraisal and prevention. So what we're going to spend to prevent these things from failing. And you see this is a, an ex, kind of an exponential curve. Well, kind of flat here and then spikes up at the end as we get here to zero defects. So there's a lot of this stuff that, you know, finding it out, there's just a small increase as we go along. And so now we can look at this is... Basically, it's the total quality cost. And so if you look at this, what are we doing? We're adding the amount of cost that we've spent in prevention to the failure cost to give us what we call our total quality cost. And this is what's interesting because what we're trying to do is basically we're trying to get and find out what this point right here is because that's the best spot to minimize because we're trying to minimize cost. We're not going to try to minimize defects because if you see this is not this is not at zero defects, but this is where the balance out is that we can make the a very quality product where the failure cost and the cost of prevention is the minimum it can be. So this is the point that we're going to be looking at when we're looking at total quality costs. And so that whole quality revolution, uh, you can sit there and you can look it up. There's an academic journal article from 92 written by Robert E. Cole and the six Japanese achievements that question Euron's quality cost trade-off model. And we're actually going to read this, I, I think uh, next week I've got this set up that we're going to read this in class and do an exercise on it. But uh, so the cost of poor quality are extensive, loss of reputation, negative word of mouth, firm wide quality effects improve uh, numerous performance measures, productivity, employee turnover, on time delivery, customer satisfaction, profitability, simultaneous pursuit of high quality and low cost. Prevent errors at the source, which is reductions of the appraisal cost. Shift the focus from looking at the products and focusing it more on the processes. And the fact that customers are willing to pay more for quality. And, and so that's where we go here. So this doesn't take, uh, so like just that last one, this doesn't take into account that as we slide it even more and more here, we can bring the cost of our product up and the demand will still be there for that. So this is an interesting article. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure in class next week we are going to talk about that.